content with, from very close quarters and therefore the accuracy of measurement is much more and it is democratic. I mean, it's uh, at, at, at will, uh, uh, on call. If you want to do it now, we can do it. But in satellite, there is a periodicity and it measures these um, parameters from a huge, huge, huge distance. And it's maybe once in a month, once in 15 days, depending on the satellite orbit. But here, you can, anybody can do whenever you want, wherever you want, uh, at will and at uh, call. So this is something which is important and very unique to drones. Now drones can also be used for so many other applications. One of them is definitely the medical application. You can see on the right bottom, it is a picture taken from net, uh, internet. And this is just happening elsewhere. And if somebody needs medical assistance in a far off region where it's inaccessible, if uh, you give a call and there's a, 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 a drone bringing up what you want along with some medical help if required. So this is something which is um, happening. And this is something very strange. I'm sure most of you would have heard about it, but this is something which we also tried to do uh, in this place in India, uh, but uh, we are able to make a lot of progress. Uh, Oliver Ridley tortoises and uh, notice, of course, I mean, hundreds and thousands of them um, come into the sea coast in a particular period of time, maybe two, two three months, and there are hundreds and thousands of them. And in fact, it could be something like 40 to 50,000 of them come in and they breed and they hatch uh, the small. Uh, smaller tortoises and they go back. The, the way they come in, how many survive, how many, how do they feed, how do they hatch these eggs and what happens to them, how uh, predators uh, uh, poach on them. And these are all things which you can't do because you have to walk across through, there is a problem with the environmentalists. But with the drones, you can simply fly them and take the entire history. It's a very beautiful natural geographic uh, tell that story and this is happening we try to do that and below that is the elephant sen census of elephants in Kerala we have we have tried to do something and tried in uh, Bengal uh, tiger uh, census and I believe uh, in crocodile the crocodiles in Australia in certain in, in certain bays are very very dense and therefore it's possible to look at them and study them and there are a lot of other uh, civilian applications, um, the government uh, administrative applications, land and building surveying using drones. These are real pictures which have uh, been taken by us, some of our colleagues. And then we can also measure the height measurements and building estimate for taxation purposes. And I'm sure some of you are in urban cities or even in uh, rural areas. Uh, see the horrendous uh, impact of traffic, which is very chaotic. And we can look at uh, census, uh, study the traffic pattern, you can also use the drones for management management of for the traffic and we can also use it for project management and study the progress of big big work for example the metro uh, metro operations how they're coming a periodic survey of the progress made by uh, used by by using drones is a eventuality uh, we can make a huge a very huge area survey for laying the railway lines because we need to know the topography of the area and the soil conditions, the conditions of the, in, uh, the surroundings, and to make a, 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 road, I mean, a railway line. And this is just uh, happening in a big way. And a very important application we, we, we in fact thought about and we almost succeeded in doing is uh, to monitor the railway tracks. Um, and for example, between Hassan and Mangalore, and there is a railway track which is very, very curved and it's very densely forest, um, forested, a lot of uh, hillocks and things like that. And periodically there are landslides and the, the driver of the train doesn't see that. And therefore between the two stations, uh, periodically you keep flying the drones and see if there's been a dangerous uh, landslide and, and if it spots it, you can uh, tell the, uh, inform the driver and the station master uh, at two different stations and locations and prevent a catastrophic accident. So railway is uh, likely to use the drones in a very, very big way. And I don't want to talk about this further because you, most of you know, traffic management, I've, I've uh, told you. But then uh, the, you must have seen the drones being operated in, in big uh, stadia, in sports grounds and big congregations. And that is something which is very important because um, it's possible if there are calamities, if there are disturbances, the, there's going to be a big, big uh, uh, catastrophic um, event in, in a big gathering like this. So that's possible. Now all these things, okay, we, we can use the drones for so many applications, but nothing will happen really if we don't have sensors 
and associated technology sensors and the technologies associated with that are the most important to make drones versatile and the application can be more when i say sensors what i'm talking about you need to have gadgets which go onto the camera I and mean, onto the uh, drones which help you to gather information the way you want how, how they want and at very good speed and there are therefore the cameras, camera gimbals, and video transmitters from, for example, if the, the drone flies about 15, 20 kilometers away, we need transmitting that huge amount of data, uh, colored information, colored photographic information, video information into transmitters. And they're going to be very, very uh, good and uh, without any distortion and loss of information. And therefore, they we, we need changing cameras which have got specific application i'll come to that later and unfortunately we don't have any one of these indigenously made there are a few here and there but they're not good so we need to launch on a very huge sensor and payload indigenization and development of these indigenously in our country so this is something which you guys should be tackling because uh, I've seen already uh, this two or three major uh, agencies, public private sector agency have done, have started and then they do a wonderful job. Now, if you look at the four, uh, the technology readiness level, uh, it is important to know where we are uh, so that you can see the business potential and technology challenges if you want to look at drones in the future. Now, drones themselves is not simply a structure, it's not simply a, 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 a a sporting event, I mean, a sporting gadget, it involves a lot of, lot of technologies, aerodynamics, structures, materials, navigation, guidance and control, communication, as I told you, more importantly, the propulsion and power, software simulation, flight vehicles and systems, devices and payloads I talked about. If you look at the whole scenario, uh, none of that is 100% complete in our environment. In fact, if you look at the census of uh, the, uh, the drones that have been used, only about 20 to 30, I mean, 70 percent of them are supposed to be Indian, but the rest of them are completely imported, imported 100 um, percent, and the rest of them are built, built out of partially imported components. That's not seriously our own brand, our own um, uh, Indian drones, which are, um, there are a few people who are coming up, and that's good to see them, but I think you guys should just be able to look at this possibility. Now, therefore, the drone market is really today very aggressive. It is uh, disruptive and very, very confusing, and you must see uh, how to handle it. So a quick uh, appreciation of the technology readiness level in the country. If you look at the, uh, the list of things, drones, indigenous critical components, control system, manufacturing uh, at an affordable cost, power supply, which with reference to endurance and range, sensors and integration, data processing. And these are the main issues which build uh, a drone. The, if you look at um, the technology readiness level, the TRL, as you call it, uh, and a scale of one to nine, uh, we have uh, a, a, a few things to be happy about. Uh, for example, the airframe structures and materials, we are fairly at a good level in terms of our readiness to handle this. Control and algorithm, we have, thanks to IT sector, we have uh, good uh, software engineers who can do, and also control engineers, we can look at this. So our level of readiness in this is six, and onboard electronics is also bad. But other major things, propulsion and power system, payload, the one, ones I was talking about, and the ability to data processing. Though we say we have a lot of um, uh, IT-enabled uh, services, data processing for specific applications, for example, agriculture, mining, disaster management, and these are the specific demands, and that needs the, uh, the, the, the dovetailing of information with experts in those specific fields, and therefore the data processing is not simply writing a code for just a general code. It has to be very specific, to the requirement and therefore this is something at a, in my opinion a very low level so we will have to overcome all these uh, things and then only we have um, drones drones being applied 
to the and exploit it to the fullest extent. Now quickly we'll jump over to the healthcare and medical 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 uh, emergencies uh, an organ transport system. And if you look at this slide, which tells you what is happening in, in places in Africa. Africa, they have a very poor infrastructure and healthcare system. And as a country, excepting a few pockets here and there, they are reasonably not so developed as uh, developed countries or developing countries in that matter. But their uh, today's context of the situation is they're using drones to send the drone with urine and uh, blood samples taken from far off remote places, inaccessible, inaccessible places, and then go to the labs, get them tested, and go back and help those people who are in distress. And this is happening in a very, very big way. It's not happening even in India, for that matter. So this is a lesson which you need to learn because then we need, we can, we should use these drones for this sort of application. You see that uh, the, the top left uh, is a fixed wing aircraft and it's launched to a um, uh, launch pad. Um, uh, 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 it is catapulted and then it goes to 60 to 70 kilometers and lands there, collects the samples and comes back. So this is something very interesting and important for a country. It's so, uh, it's so important, true of our country as well. Now there is a possibility today, there are a lot, I mean, sorry, the, the organs are being now uh, transplanted and transplanted to I mean, transport it from one place to another. And this is becoming more frequent and there are more needy people and more, there are many people who want to volunteer to give them. And this, uh, to, to study this, we have many, many uh, seminars and uh, workshops going on in the country. And one of them here, I've just shown. But principally we're talking about four uh, elements, four uh, types of organs. And this is the heart, the lungs, the kidneys, and the, the liver, which are very, very critical and these are the things which are available when, whenever a person is uh, sort of is brain dead, for example. But the problem is uh, these uh, uh, organs, it's, it's, it's an effort. If you look at the way these are uh, transported, just take an example of an organ coming from Mangalore to Bangalore. Um, it is harvested uh, in, a, in a, uh, the operation set in a hospital. It has to be transported to the aerodrome, uh, to the airport, to a road. And roads are clogged with traffic, with unmanageable traffic. So the police personnel actually clear the entire road length between the airport and the hospital. And they clear it off completely for maybe two to three hours. And an ambulance takes the organ, goes, rushes to the aircraft, and then the aircraft lifts it to the destination airport. And then, uh, then from there again, the same story repeats. Again, you have to make another green corridor where traffic is again disrupted for two to three hours. Ambulance takes it, the organ is rushed to the operation theater, and that is operated upon and in another hospital. This whole process takes uh, sometimes more than four hours and the heart is dead by that time so you've got to take a big risk in doing this whereas if you have a drone which can carry this uh, we, the drone can take the, uh, the heart from the top of the hospital and, and fly directly to the other hospital the destination hospital it takes hardly two hours one and a half hours maybe three hours but this heart is uh, this organ is um, still alive and within four hours, you can complete the operation. You save the patient, and the purpose is all done. So this is uh, the advantage of using drones. I'll skip this slide because it's a little too time and uh, too time consuming, and I'm running short of time already. Now, therefore, what are the uh, the, the types of uh, drones that they can that they, that can use or you can use for organ transport? There are several old old uh, vintage quadcopters, uh, uh, for example. A lot of things are being done to increase the, the uh, so, so shall we say, the endurance of this. We can fly for maybe uh, one to two hours, but they're not good enough. Therefore, we are looking at modern aircraft, which are not uh, necessarily quad. It could be a hexcopter, like what I've shown here, and it could also be, uh, or it could be a helicopter. It's all happening elsewhere in Europe and uh, all over. And we also have a launch program here. And it could also be a hybrid drone, like I was talking in the beginning of this talk of the webinar. 
uh, which can lift off vertically and then dash off horizontally. And this helps you to handle maybe more than 40 kg of poor payload. And then it can have a range of 300 to 400 kilometers and can fly uninterrupted for three to four hours. And this is what enables us to say, for example, from uh, Bangalore to Mysore, you can transport an organ, or from Bangalore to Hyderabad, perhaps in the years to come, is possible without disturbing the ground, uh, ground uh, traffic. So these are the types of um, um, the long endurance hybrid drones. I have explained this to you. These drones have uh, four propellers to lift the aircraft vertically like a helicopter and a propeller here which pushes it like a fixed wing aircraft and it travels very fast. And the, the, the conventional drones cannot make more than maybe 30 to 40 kilometers per hour and it's very difficult but then these can do something like 200 300 uh, kilometers per hour and therefore you can cover long distances um, with this type of hybrid aircraft. And if they are also linked to a fuel cell, I mean, if they're powered by fuel cell, which have got a long, um, um, I mean, large power, uh, and it can fly for more than four to six hours continuously. So this is something which I've summarized here. These drones, the quadcopters, the X-copter, et cetera, are now being powered by lithium polymer batteries, which are powerful. The energy density is quite high. And you can see the smallest of them, a smaller version of that is about 3,000 3, milliampere hours. But we also have 45,000 milliampere hours. They're big enough. Uh, but then uh, we need to design the aircraft or the drone to handle this weight apart from that. So in my opinion, fuel cell is the, is the key to this, uh, increasing the range and the payload capacity of the drones. And I think some of you should therefore study fuel cells and how they can be miniaturized or can be made reduced weight to go on to drones. We also have uh, IC engines which are powering. In fact, if you recall, if you, I don't know whether you come across, uh, we have a big team in Chennai in the uh, University. Uh, they are using IC engines to power the drones. And this is one of them fixed, I mean, two stroke opposed to a piston engine on the, on the right, on the left side here. And we also have radial piston engines, which is, of course, um, look big frontal area but they have a tremendous uh, top uh, power potential the, these IC engines are reciprocating engine these two but this one is a rotary IC engine and you guys must understand what is the difference the advantages and disadvantages of both uh, uh, linear that is reciprocating IC engines and rotary IC engines. So I think that that is something which you must understand because this will have a very huge potential in increasing the payload capacity and and the the range of uh, now the the medical drone which I was talking about uses these boxes uh, to pack the organs. It is extra, ex, um, extracted or harvested from the patient. And immediately wrapped in a medical uh, bag, which is a sort of sterile material, and is uh, packed with uh, two or three layers of ice, and it is sealed, and then uh, taken uh, to the aircraft or to the germ. Back because it will hurt the heart or lung or what which we're all talking about. They should not be damaged in transit, and therefore, uh, but the uh, the limitation of this sort of uh, conventional ice box, if you like to call them, is they are good enough only for about two to four hours. And in fact, the temperature also is an important factor in this. You have to maintain absolute four degrees. You cannot afford to lose the temperature uh, because of long flight duration. Whereas we are now talking about uh, looking at what is called perfusion uh, container. Perfusion container, a container in which a heart or It is pumped with, I mean, it's made to pump liquid. A pump, a liquid is pumped into this heart, and the heart muscles are kept in you know, con um, continuous movement. It's uh, maybe it's not at the same rate of 72 beats per minute, but a lower rate. And the temperature is also kept absolutely at a four degree temperature. So there is this advantage. It can make the heart uh, be healthy for not four hours, but 12 hours by doing this perfusion. And this, uh, these are all available already in, uh, in uh, the hospitals where surgery takes place. But if you can miniaturize this, 
miniaturize this and make it uh, compatible with the drone, you have go to save heart and keep it alive for 12 hours, which is something very, very important for the heart to be um, uh, preserved until the, uh, the, the uh, transplant is successfully made. So this is a challenge, guys. You must look at what is, it's a, it's a combination of mechanical, biomedical, uh, all sorts of disciplines. And therefore, this already a couple of programs are going on in the country. But I think some of you should join together and be able to look at uh, developing what are called perfusion containers, which will increase the, the longevity of the heart harvested for a transplant in another hospital. Now this is uh, a container, but uh, there's a drone, there's a container, but what is more important is you've got to be able to plan the flight path between, say, for example, uh, so take an example of, uh, say, Bangalore and Vellore, uh, from Bangalore, um, Apollo, or CMC, uh, you, the, the, the immediate uh, uh, inference is it should be at the shortest distance and a straight line uh, as, the, as the crow flies. But what really happens is, in actual practice, when you're flying, it may take an hour, one hour or one and a half hours, but you're flying, there could be rain, there could be something lightning, or there could be some obstacles which are unforeseen. Typically, they have a, a map, they have the weather forecast, they're all going to flight planning, but nothing is certain, there's a dynamic situation. If something would happen, uh, you need to make the, the drone uh, uh, intelligent enough to see what's coming up, obstacle or maybe a weather change, you must the, 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 the drone should automatically change its course of uh, movement. Uh, the best way, the most optimum way, without going uh, to taking too much time, which is the most optimum way, uh, and reach the destination. And you should also keep the end destination, the hospitals, the, the APCs, the police personnel along the route, they're informed about it's a change of plan. So there is a need for dynamic um, uh, you know, the flight plans, which is possible for a drone to take uh, because you're in infusing the artificial intelligence through that. So you need to have uh, systems which will uh, get feedback from sensors, from um, mapping, uh, from the cameras, and be able to take a wise and a quick decision to make sure that your mission is not jeopardized and you reach the destination without any problem. What can go wrong? A lot of things go wrong. You can have transmission towers with electromagnetic radiation. We have wind power, windmills, and they also disturb the environment. If you're flying close to the windmill, the drone can get upset. We can have an unforeseen, I mean, not unforeseen, but uh, unplanned, uh, which is missing in a plan, uh, hillocks and things like that, water bodies, lightning, as I said, maybe a fog, maybe rain. Uh, all these things can come in. And the, the, intelligent, the, the drone with that artificial intelligence should be able to see, foresee this obstacles and change its course, path, path of a flight path, and be able to reach. So therefore, you need to have artificial intelligence and through machine learning, whatever is the, the process. But then you need to have the elux mounted with the altitudes, uh, within the altitude ceiling, ability to take off and land at unknown location. So if there was a very serious problem, the, the, the drone should be able to gently land and tell the guys that I have landed here, they will come back and have, have somebody to come and just uh, do something quickly so that uh, the, the patient who is there on the, on the hospital operation table is not going to be uh, surprised. Clear water bodies, clear populated urban and rural areas, handle EMI interference. And they all have to be, and in fact, sometimes to be, if you're going, uh, for example, if you're flying from here, the drone cannot fly over Elanka Airport. It's a no-fly zone. So you should be able to recognize no-fly zones in a mapping. And then for a lot of, lot of things, as I mentioned, lightning, rain, fog, gusts, heavy wind. Heavy wind is very difficult to, uh, to predict even uh, one hour before the flight. So we need to have the intelligence introduced into the system to look at all these things and take a, a very, very um, wise, quick decision to overcome that. So this is about uh, medical drones. I mean, and let's quickly get into the agriculture drones and I have a shortage of time. I'll quickly rush through. Um, the, the, this is, the situation is very similar. We have a huge, huge market for agriculture thing. And already you're seeing in, the, in our country, a lot of, lot of agriculture applications happening. And I will skip this because then I don't have time to, but then you, you must know that you have a huge, huge potential coming uh, facing you 
and you can you must exploit that if possible. And you name it, you, the drones can do everything in agriculture sector, agriculture, horticulture, forestry, aquaculture, whatever you want, uh, this, the drones can do. Spraying, thermal imagery of the land, soil testing, pesticides or spraying of pesticides and fertilizers. And you saw recently uh, locusts uh, affecting uh, Rajasthan and Delhi area. So the drones can be effective. We didn't use that very similarly effectively because we were not warned early. But you should be able to handle the locust menace in a very, very, very good way using a cluster of not one drone, but a series of hundreds of them or tens of them should be able to uh, uh, handle this uh, emergency. Now there are several things that we have done uh, in, in the country and some of these uh, you know, shots are from our own effort here in India. You can see uh, fixed wing vehicles, you know, the X-copters, which are used for agriculture and uh, land mapping. And uh, this uh, slide is a bit noisy. What I will do, I'll just uh, pass, uh, pass for a half a minute. And these are some of the uh, video clips that uh, were tried in, in, uh, in effort in Andhra Pradesh and in poor areas of uh, Karnataka. And therefore, um, I'll, I'll keep silent, but I'll uh, pass for about half a minute just for you to appreciate. I'm sure most of you would have seen these things uh, in video clips and maybe you have done all the yourselves. Okay, now what do they do? They'll uh, identify a lot of um, uh, forested area, afforestation problems are there. And then you can identify barren and cultivated areas. Um, things which are, um, uh, for example, you can identify the type of uh, trees and plants, density, and the yield that, that is likely to come to these um, areas. And as I said, we can use uh, fertilizers, uh, I'm sorry, spraying, uh, crop dusting. Uh, for pesticides or fertilizers on uh, area agricultural uh, lands, agricultural plants or um, agricultural uh, uh, big areas. Now the issue is it, it's not like uh, running a, a big helicopter and having a carpet uh, fly over the zone and spray whatever you want uh, at what, from a particular height. This is a very intelligent, um, uh, what they call a micro, micro, micro farming, micro farming. It identifies the area where uh, the fertilizers are indeed required and how much is required, what type of pesticide or fertilizer is required. And this is something which uh, the camera system and the software that is developed can handle. This is already happening and we need to add a lot of value. It's another example of what we did the long, long time, like about two, three years back, of trying to spray, develop a spraying um, um, a drone, an X-copter, to uh, handle plants. And I'll, I'll skip over after some time for a few minutes, for a few seconds. You can see the spring, spring at a low altitude. It can go over front uh, end here. It can also go over, uh, for example, a coconut palms, a huge lands or acreage of uh, coconut trees. It can be sprayed uh, to look at the diseases of the, the leaves of the coconut uh, plantations. So this is what I wanted to tell. Now, all these good things I've spoken, at least two, two good things I've spoken with an application, but we can misuse these drones. And there are uh, many instances of, uh, many instances of uh, drones being misused by unauthorized people, unauthorized drones, unauthorized pilots, and with mal intentions. Uh, the terrorists can do a terrible job out of this. So we are now talking about developing apart from the useful applications of drones, drones for useful applications, we're also trying to develop technologies out of drones themselves, which can, uh, which are called anti-drone anti, anti technologies, that is to prevent uh, drones from doing mischief, um, not the right thing to do. And there are several possibilities, and you can take control of this, if you spot a drone, if you find it is uh, unauthorized, now, how to do that is another big uh, uh, issue, but having seen them as an unauthorized drone, uh, we can spoof it up. That is, you can take control of that and bring it down gently to your quarters. Or you can jam them, and if you jam the electronics of the unauthorized drone, uh, they, they sort of fall, fall down, 
typically they don't fall down in uh, wherever it wants. This program, most of our program to go back to the uh, site of launch. So we are trying to push it away. But if you feel that nothing works, you may have to destroy it. You may have to neutralize it. And there are many, many methods of doing it. You can kill them. You can blast them. Into... Now I'll skip this because I'm running short of time. And what can these anti I mean, drones can do? They can attack the administrative buildings, hospitals, water bodies, for, for example, or water filtration areas, and then so, uh, the software parts, nuclear power stations, which, which is very important for us, and the airports, and oil wells, and sea. All this can be attacked by uh, unauthorized drones. They can uh, also attack places of worship and archaeological monuments, which are uh, emotional. Uh, 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 you know, whatever, uh, uh, places uh, where you don't want to a lot of damage in places where a lot of people congregate for maybe big, big religious functions and I've just placed a few of them. All this needs to be done and we're not fantasizing. It's happened, it's happening continuously here and there. So the oil wells were attacked. The Heathrow airport was, um, was well, people cited drones, anti-drones, I mean, unauthorized drones in the airport and that was struck for three days. And we had uh, many instances of VIP being uh, shot at by drones. So a lot of, lot of uh, mischief or very bad things can happen. There are several possibilities, several uh, drone threats, and there are many people who need to be working together to huge business investment. And at least in India, we have already seen at least 10 to 15 major people working towards developing technologies to, um, to, to, uh, to neutralize these drones. And how to identify these drones? There are several uh, authorized, uh, unauthorized drones. There are several possibilities, uh, optical, uh, thermal, visual, magnetic, acoustic, and other. I wish you guys uh, spend a little time in finding out what are the technologies available. But you also have a very fundamental, very, uh, very, very I mean, it's, it looks funny, but uh, there are trained falcons which go and attack the drones, I'm sure some of you have already looked at there, these possibilities. So this is something which um, uh, is a big business potential. How to identify uh, uh, drones which are unauthorized? Uh, because you see a drone, how, to, what do, how do you make out they're, uh, they're unauthorized? So there must be mechanism of identifying, there must be license, there must be registered, a pilot who is operating that should be registered, and that information should be uh, available to you when, they, when the drones are flying around. So if you don't get them on your chart, you must call it as an unauthorized drone. And having author, uh, identified unauthorized drones, how to handle them? Or can you spoof it, uh, spoof it out? Uh, um, uh, without any uh, collateral damage to the population below. This is something that's already happening all over. And I think you must study the anti-drone technologies in the, in the, in the world scenario but in house here in, in in india there are a lot of private industries which have just started um, uh, these anti-drone technologies and one of the private sector we are very proud of what they have done uh the Bharat electronics limited they they have got spoofing they have got hacking and neutralizing possibilities with these um, uh, with these uh, uh, sort of gadgets which they, they have developed this is happening we can also protect very important defense installation, maybe air, air fields, or any, for example, um, the, the, the Bidan South, for example, you can have sensors around and they will detect the drones which are coming in, unauthorized drones which are coming in, and they will alert police, alert the security, and alert the battery of drones which are ready to fight. So these detection ranges are today very limited, maybe half a kilometer. But I think we need to develop these sensors, which can be placed around uh, the very important installations, uh, maybe temples, maybe archaeological thing, water uh, treatment plants, uh, whatever, whatever. So, but then these sensors are the things which are part of the anti-drone technology and how to make the sensors very effective and have a long range and very accuracy, 24-7 operational. And they, these are some of the technologies which you must look at. Having said this, there's a wonderful application of um, set of these drones, of these drones, which are not really drones. I mean, they are actually 
called high altitude pseudo satellites. This is a recent um, uh, sort of development which is taking place in Moldova. I, we are a little late in this. We have started looking at this. This is to make a drone, which is slightly bigger than a conventional drone, but make them go up uh, altitude wise, go to the stratosphere. The stratosphere in the center, I have um, uh, given some information on the temperature and the density of the air, um, pressure and the, the temperature. If you can see the stratosphere, which is about 10, uh, 10 to um, 50 kilometers, uh, range, I mean altitude range, there the temperature uh, at about say uh, 45 kilometers is about minus 5 degrees or two, I mean zero, 0 degrees. It's not minus 56. As you go up to, uh, say for example, troposphere, the temperature drops it's to a very low level, and you can't operate, and there, there is enough air there, uh, aircraft fly. But at stratosphere, the density is so low, and therefore you can park a big drone in that altitude and make it work and stay there for a long time. We are not talking about half an hour deployment. We are talking about three months, four months. In a particular area, it can be hovering around. The area is low. If it is powered by electric motor, it's no problem. And it's only zero or five, minus five degrees, so it's not an issue at all. Only problem is power. And therefore, if you can um, look at uh, the power supply for this, it, the solar power mount the solar panels mounted on the on the on the, uh, the drone but why do you want to do that if you are able to look at um, uh, drone for maybe four four months we can look at for just to give an example we'll look at uh Wysak, we'll look at uh, maybe today we have serious floods and rains in the north northeast if you're able to uh, make it over there we can find out what's happening to the weather? Well, why not what is happening to the tornadoes? What's happening to uh, local uh, homeland security? What's happening to the beaches? Well, is there any uh, ship movement? The ports which are not authorized are coming into the shore. All these things can be done, but can you not do with the satellites? No satellites, as I mentioned earlier, come round to the spot only once in a week or 10 days, 50 days, depending on the orbit. So there's not continuous monitoring, whereas this uh, has, is gets parked at that altitude with powerful cameras. We can do whatever you want. It could be for many things. Uh, for example, you can look at study glaciers. You can look at uh, the, the uh, wind patterns, weather, weather forecasting. All these things possible, provided you are able to launch this to about that uh, altitude, something like 25 to 50 kilometers, something which you must be able to do. And there are already uh, uh, hats being developed at university level. So this is something which you must um, be. Today, the government is supporting private industries to do this, and why not have a private industry look at hubs? And there already, we have uh, very many discussions in various places, including ISRO, Aeronautical Society of India, and it's a feasible uh, project. I mean, you can have the hub parked all over the course, wherever you want. The hubs technology is something which is very green. We can also have, um, the, the, the aerostats, uh, aerostats which are powered aerostats, it's not really aerostats, not, uh, not air, 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 uh, air, mot air motors, if you like. Uh, they are powered by solar and they can get parked at that height because density is so low. I mean, this is a technology which is coming up. And uh, as I said, the one drone is not good enough to handle uh, a locust menace. You need to be uh, handling 20, 30, 40, maybe 100 of them. If you want to look at um, a survey of, uh, of a far big forest, you can't do a survey with one drone. Uh, you can't cover everything in one day. And the animals which are there in one place go more away to the other place. So if you can employ 20 of them in one forest area at the same time, we can make a survey within a day. We don't have to wait for two, three months. And therefore we must have this ability to fly many drones, many types of drones, all in a swarm, um, as a group of uh, uh, drones, uh, like, like, a, like a swarm of birds. And this is the technology, which is uh, very old. I mean, we are at least 20 years behind, but we need to develop this swarm uh, flying technology, a uh, dynamic swarm control. Uh, they must just, uh, I know they, they should not clash together. 
they must uh, fly the way that every each plane has been each drone has been planned to do fly and they do the work as per the mission uh, dedicated uh, uh, sort of assigned to them so this is an important thing and so what what makes this happen you must have a powerful um, obstacle avoidance technology uh, ability to uh, have flight plans and ability to recognize each other and be able to do that it's not necessarily only drones the drones in the air can get connected to satellites as i've shown here they can get connected to even uh, underwater vehicles, which I've shown here. Underwater vehicles, and then the surface boards, and then the drones, and of course the satellites. This is the total network picture, and this is happening slowly but surely. In a, in a, in a very um, disturbed area, this becomes a very important uh, necessity to connect up the uh, drones, uh, the vehicles at all levels, the space, uh, mid-air, surface and then land and then underwater so this is something which is important now the drones have also been uh, used for looking at the bird strikes in in, in airfields their airfields and uh, very uh, close to the airfields the birds can the the aerostats can be used at the airports to monitor the bird bird movement the habitats of birds and then safety of the aircraft uh, um, with reference to birds we can scare the birds away from the airport area using this aerostats, but we, today we are now talking about using bigger drones, which can go and spare chemicals, use laser lights, and scare the birds away from the airport and make the airport safer from the point of view of bird hits on the aircraft, which is happening very frequently and it's increasing because the type of number of flights is increasing and it's moving closer to the urban areas. So we have lots and lots of body menace, and therefore we must be able to do all this. So you need to have a big survey of all the airports and just give an example of Mysore, Hubli, Mangalore, Vijayawada, there are new airports and 150 more airfields are coming up in the country, maybe more than that and the number of uh, flights is going to increase. So as students who are interested in bird strike, you need to study bird strike, you need to study bird impact on the aircraft and the engines, you need to also mix bird uh, habitat studies and mix The study of bird habitat around the airports. So this uh, was the focus in a couple of um, major meetings across the country. And there's a bird strike research group uh, in India of India in Bangalore, and they're trying to garner support from all people, from faculty, from engineers, from administrators, and of course the students, and to look at bird uh, bird strike and the hazard to aircraft at many many levels. Uh, starting from bird strike uh, studies, bird habitat studies, uh, design of aircraft and engines to withstand bird strikes, and several several things on the agenda. So this is something which I thought I just mentioned to you, so so that you go back and study uh, these issues whenever it occurs. So to summarize, uh, I've taken it more than what I should. Uh, to summarize, the artificial intelligence is the backbone. I mean, if you want to use drones more effectively and make it more uh, versatile. Just flying drones uh, with a RC controller uh, is, not, I mean, the radio controller is not good enough. It's just a, a, a passion. It's just a hobby. But you want to make it professional. You need to push uh, artificial intelligence in handling the, the drones, the outputs, and then the data processing should all back up, be backed up by artificial intelligence. And I was mentioning about the dynamic flight planner and attempt. help us in looking at drone being used in virtual corridors. They must be designated. Priority to be based on anti-drone technologies. I give a glimpse of what anti-drones are, anti-drone technologies are. And I think we should look at uh, this issue. Uh, it cannot be fought with a few drones. It has to be done with hundreds of them. And how to fly hundreds of them, how to coordinate amongst themselves. And fuel technology is an important thing because it's going to increase the range and the endurance of the drones. Uh, drones which are now limited to a few kilometers, excepting these uh, defense drones. Civilian uh, drones are very limited in, uh, in range and payload capacity. 
that will go up tremendously if you use fuel cells. And I told you about bird radar stitter drones and perhaps the high altitude uh, pseudo satellites. And these are very tremendous application potential, both for civilian and uh, the non-civilian applications, including homeland security, weather forecasting. The tremendous potential, guys. You need to look at uh, drones. Drone, uh, not just as a hobby uh, fun, but at serious uh, engineering applications for both civilian and defense application. And more importantly, for medical and agricultural applications, so deep core. If you look at uh, Israel, if you look at some of the European countries, these are being used in a very, very big way. And I think we should uh, take a cue from that and push ourselves into doing that. It's, it's also a big business potential. And those of you who are in, uh, into that, I think you can see. There are, I'm, I see we, about uh, three, uh, 10 years back, we had a few operators of drones in the country, a few people who could develop drones in the country. Today, not less than 300 to 400 are there, uh, people who keep flying them, keep manufacturing them. And one important thing I forgot to tell you, you must uh, do a pilot certification. Without pilot certification, uh, people will not be allowed to pilot them. And, therefore, and then there is tremendous schooling, uh, uh, teaching ability, training ability, training potential for uh, making good pilots of drones without the wave. The expectation is in about coming two years or three years. We need about 5,000 to 6,000 pilots who are certified pilots who will be able to handle the load of operating drones in the country. So this is a very rushed job. I'm sorry I had to do this, but then I thought the idea was only to tell you, uh, apart from whatever you know, some additional information to make uh, drones uh, stick in your mind as a very uh, important And those of you who might have some questions, um, I don't know what the organizers have done. Uh, probably they will send the the questions uh, and I, the questions are there in the question and answer uh, box sir which i don't see there um, it's at the bottom uh, you can uh, yeah. if you click on the q and a Harish and i has asked for what are the angles between x frame and x design copter to be efficient but there is absolutely there's nothing like one uh, optimal angle. I mean, X frame, uh, we have a, almost something like um, uh, flat. Uh, it's a truly X 45 degrees. And there are also frames which are actually 15 degrees, 20 degrees. It all depends on the specific design. I don't see, I don't see, um, uh, am I audible today? Okay, okay very good. So, um, so there is no such thing as, I mean, it depends on the type of um, power supply you have, the controllers you have. And then uh, obviously from the point of view of maneuverability, um, uh, if you have a very deep, uh, that is longish uh, X frame, you have a problem of um, the stability in the lateral directions. And the, I mean, from a simplistic point of view, uh, X with 45 degree or 90 degree is about the best in my opinion, but then there could be a lot of other arguments for and against that. And then we have an uh, anonymous attendee. If drone is used uh, for a delivery of packages, how can you have a check on what is being delivered? It can be misused, yeah, obviously. It can be misused. So all uh, these people who are now Amazon, for example, have to register their uh, drones. They have to register their pilots. They have to tell the operators and the, the corridor in which they're operating. All the authorities should be told. And they have a ceiling on the height of uh, delivery, uh, height of operation. And there must be a uh, stand guarantee. And today, our legal system is very, very fragile and it's not very robust. Uh, who is going to be held responsible uh, if something happens and if it hurts somebody on the, on the, on the street, on the, in the market while it's flying? And so these uh, legal issues also have to be taken care of and it's not there. But to answer your question, um, uh, uh, what is, um, it can be misused uh, for sure. And uh, therefore, So that's the reason why today DGCA doesn't allow uh, unauthorized, um, unlicensed drones. They have to inform, take permission from the police. They must uh, fly within 
60 meters, 200 feet altitude. They can't fly above that. And they have distance. But that is something which cannot be handled by these people who use the drones for supply. If you want to supply uh, a medicine box, for example, from here to, to Whitefield, it is simply out of uh, visible range. So obviously you cannot. So all these things need to be relaxed. And I think we are fighting for those uh, relaxations and uh, the sort of practical um, limits in which you can operate it. Satellites have same application. Then why are we using the drones? Yeah, this is what I said. Satellites, uh, satellite has got a, one particular satellite got a, uh, in orbit at a particular altitude, and it goes around the Earth, maybe once in 10 days, once in 15 days, once in three days, once in, depending on the location where it is parked, or the altitude where it's parked. So you, you can't get satellite pictures continuously, and I can't get satellite, for example, the satellite may be holding, um, going around, it may be seeing a middle part of India, but if you want to look at today, uh, some part in Kashmir, uh, the satellite is not geared up to do that. And even if it's able to capture that, it cannot do continuously. It goes around the Earth. It gives you a picture every three days, every 10. It depends on the altitude of the, the orbit. But the satellite, I'm sorry, the drones can be planned to go very close to uh, the land, very, uh, whatever location, and whenever you want. You can do it night, you can do it in the morning, you can do it in the, uh, in the evening, and you can do it continuously. So there is no... Uh, therefore, the picture that you get, and picture that you get, the, the information that you get from satellite is a little um, broad uh, range, where a satellite can give you an accuracy, a range of, uh, say, two to three centimeters, whereas the satellite pictures are good enough, uh, maybe half a meter or a meter. So the accuracy, the definition of information is a little less. But the advantage of satellite is it gives you overall picture of the whole area which is difficult for a satellite to get I and mean, drones to get. So drone is localized, satellite is um, generalized, overall thing. So this is the difference between the satellite picture and the, um, the drone picture, drone, drone data. Uh, then the government regulation is still very tight in India regarding drone flights in and around Ceres. Are there any changes going to happen to help easy permission? Yeah, uh, this is what is happening. We had a, a a couple of uh, states in the North India, they have uh, got permission to operate specific drones specific for specific application anytime. They got a gross uh, general license and then a permission from the DGCA to fly for specific. It is government controlled, government operated. And um, we, we also had a big long chat in the Karnataka Knowledge Commission of uh, State of Government of Karnataka. And we are now representing uh, the, uh, our issue with the DGCA to allow, for example, a 300 to 400 kilometers uh, flight of a drone which is carrying a medical drone, a medical uh, organ or medical uh, uh, sort of, uh, so medicine, for example. Uh, that cannot be done at uh, 200 feet altitude. It has to fly much higher. And therefore, uh, for such extreme conditions, we are trying to get um, uh, relief or uh, exceptions from DGCA to be able to operate that uh, much, much better. Why copter uh, cop, uh, as the CW, that is kind of, uh, clockwise and anti rotating wings, because if they, all of them rotate in one direction, the, the system will not be safe. The reaction, the, uh, the, 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 it will spin uh, or uh, yaw around the, on the vertical axis. And to make it like a helicopter, for example, if you have seen a helicopter, it's got a major propeller at the top, horizontally spinning. Uh, whereas there is a, a tiny little, uh, um, shall we say, a tail rotor, which is there at the back. And that is basically to see that it doesn't rotate because of the reaction. The torque reaction will make the uh, helicopter body spin in the opposite direction. And to prevent that, there is a tail rotor which compensates for the torque reaction and make the helicopter safe. So like that, very similar argument for the quadcopter. If all the four were to be rotating either clockwise or anti-clockwise, the, the quad will not be stable in, it will not uh, remain stable in one axis. It will start spinning in its own plane. Uh, to counter that, 
two of them are clockwise and two of them anticlockwise. And apart from that, the, this the directional rotation and the difference in directional rotation also helps you to maneuver the, uh, the, the system the way you want. It could be your, it could pitch, it can roll, and you can have a lateral movement. Uh, maybe and a combined uh, combination of all these things possible if the, uh, because you made two of them rotate in the opposite direction as compared to the other two in a quadcopter. If then any regulation has been followed by CAR for civilian problems, not yet, not yet. We, 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 are, we are trying to, we are trying to get that uh, thing. Uh, can roads be the future mode of human transportation? Well, future, you need to define the future. If you're talking about two years from today, it may be difficult. If you're talking about 10 years from today, it's possible. In the UAE, the uh, Arab Emirates, uh, we already have a belief and we have seen the photographs and the video clips. And uh, from the city airport, to the city, there are the one-seater and two-seater uh, drones, which uh, which act like taxis. That is, from the airport to the center of the city, uh, top of the building, the drones are used as uh, taxis. And therefore, this uh, that's possible. But in our country, I think we need to wait for some more time because an absolute safety is required because we don't want uh, the drones. Uh, uh, having reliability and safety issues, the passengers, two of them are sitting there or at a risk. But more importantly, equally important is the collateral damage. If it falls down in a city market area, for example, we have a big, big issue. So we need to make sure uh, these safety and regulation issues are covered before we can look at uh, human transportation. It's possible. Is it possible for a drone to be fully automatic without human assistance regarding obstacle handling? Yes, this is precisely what we are trying to do. There are drones which are having um, uh, the intelligence have been planned, uh, but you can't just let it go. It is actually terrain mapped. Within a known map, map uh, territory of the known mapping data, uh, it is made intelligent because you feed all the terrestrial um, data, uh, weather data, uh, and uh, any other data of, uh, uh, relating to issues of safety and reliability. And therefore, the drone can lift off and go around. Uh, in fact, uh, the, the Indian Institute of Science has demonstrated that it can simply go through um, a plantation uh, which is full of uh, tamarind trees, uh, the arca trees, and coconut trees. It goes through uh, these, um, the, the passages between the trees in a, an enclosed uh, a yard, I mean farm yard and farm land. So if you have to see the, uh, the upcoming Arakana uh, tree or, or um, a coconut tree and is able to maneuver itself. Obviously, it is a slow process. Today is developing uh, at a slow pace, but obviously uh, with the passage of time, we should be able to handle uh, the drones at required speed, keeping in mind the, all the obstacles and may make, become fully automatic. And so that's not impossible. Uh, is it possible, did I miss something else? Is it possible for a drone to finish that? Is it possible to hack the drone or quadcopter? Yeah, this is precisely what you're trying to do. If uh, you are able to, uh, an authorized drone is being um, targeted and it's possible today to take over, to uh, take over its controls uh, and bring them safely back uh, to the to your uh, yard and then confiscate it. Uh, if that is possible with a unauthorized drone, why it should not be possible for a, uh, in fact, this happens mostly in the border areas. Today, the cross-border uh, drone operation is all, um, because is all very worrisome because when you're flying close to the border, there's a possibility that your drone can be simply be captured, high, hijacked or hacked away uh, to other borders. Because you, you, you've got a lot of information stored in the, uh, in the, in the drone, in the quadcopter, for example. And this is something which is possible. And we need to have countermeasures so that uh, you don't fall prey to somebody's uh, program of, uh, of hacking away or kidnapping your system. How can we replace thrust from motors in drones with other thrust generators like turbines? Well, uh, the turbines, actually, yeah, we are we the. <laughs> We, we are trying to do that, but then uh, when you talk about um, drones, you don't use uh, gas turbines, uh, turbines, for example, on 
uh, quadcopters or rotocopters. In a fixed wing vehicle, which is a drone for civilian application, we are trying small gas turbines and they, they are a good um, possible application because you can fly at a very high speed uh, and you can store fuel and the thrust that is developed like it's typical like an aircraft, a mini aircraft if you like. So today it is not necessarily limited to um, the electric motors. We can also use gas turbines or the turbines to push, to give thrust to the fixed wing aircraft. But unfortunately it can be used for quad rotors and quadcopters or uh, multi multicopters. Uh, please answer this. Has anyone used UAVs for remote sensing of coastal features and processes? So obviously, yes, there are plenty of things. And in fact, this is the day in and day out of uh, the, the preoccupation of all the defense establishments. They are surveying all, um, uh, all, all uh, coastal areas. But we are talking about remote sensing of um, Coastal, uh, coastal areas. Now the coastal areas are actually, if I look at this, uh, to give an example, um, fishing, um, then natural resources uh, in the coastal areas for uh, remote sensing, uh, you fly the drones and find out from uh, say, um, uh, hypo, uh, hyperspectral cameras, find out the areas where in the sea below, you're flying at uh, two kilometers altitude, but you can spot the areas in the sea or ocean where fishing is very, very potential. That is, it gives out the radiation, you get a kind of picture of fish which is there in the, in the water. In specific areas, it gives us a different color uh, pattern. And thus you can capture through the camera and tell the boatsman or the fisheries department to go and fish in that location because your hull, your um, output from fishing is going to be maximum, and that's one uh, good example. It's happening day in and day out uh, using UAVs. UAVs need not be quadcopters because quadcopters cannot reach too much deep into the sea, but using the fixed wing aircraft or the fixed wing drones, this is being possible. And we also have cameras which can go deep into the water and find out the type of temperature, temperature, um, the bathymetry of. Um, water in the, around the coastal region. We are trying to use, for example, drones to go and find out if coastal area, water near the coastal area where atomic power plants are there, if there is a radiation in the water, which is not acceptable at all. So we can fly by flying the uh, drones close to the sea and uh, water, I mean water level, we can find out if, by using a gigamilo counter, uh, whether there is a radiation which is unacceptable. Uh, maybe there is a flushing of radiation uh, contaminated water into the sea. So we can look at, um, the, we can sense the, the atomic uh, radiation levels in and around the atomic power plants. So there are a lot of other things. For example, the oil spillage, we can see the extent of oil spillage uh, from, it can be captured from satellite, but we have a real picture close to the sea's, um, sea, sea level uh, by flying this, um, uh, the drones and you can find out oil spillage. So a lot of lot of application for remote sensing uh, in that sense, yes. If I build a drone from a college project should be good a license to fly it. No, but there is a, a, an exception to this for academic work and for R&D projects. Uh, the DGCA has allowed people to build, but you must inform the local police, um, the local authority, whoever it is. Uh, but it is not that you should get a license to fly it. But license to fly it, you might want in the days to come. You can't fly it unless you have a license. But today, nobody has a license. It's all done within the campus of the uh, university or the college. And you build it and you fly it. As long as it doesn't go out of your precincts, uh, there is no necessity for, for licensing it. A license to fly it, there's no necessity for registering the, uh, the drone uh, today. But it's going to come soon because then we have almost um, finalized and it's going to be launched. So every, every drone should be registered and every pilot should be, I mean, every flyer should be uh, certified by competent authority and that should be informed to the police. But for academic institutes and R&D organization having R&D projects, uh, there is an exception to have license for flying or license to build. Is that uh, internet? Some more? Some more? Okay. 
Oh, thank you. Okay, then how, how to improve payload carrying capacity of drones because they have heavy battery payload? Yeah, this is a wonderful question. I don't think I have answer for this. Uh, how to increase and basically you must have, um, for example, today we are talking about a quadcopter with eight kilowatts of motor power. Uh, there's a huge, huge, a huge motor. Eight kilowatts is a, a very huge motor. And that uh, can take up about 200, uh, 200 kilowatts, I mean, 200 kg of, um, sorry, 150 kg of uh, payload, everything, including the structural weight and the payload, uh, it can do. But um, you know what it means to fly with four, eight kilowatts uh, motor? It means an enormous battery, enormous, the, 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 the wires get heated up so quickly because it's carrying such a huge current uh, to feed the motor of eight kilowatts ring. Even if it's a one kilowatt, half a kilowatt, it's a huge, huge power. So the only only um, solution that uh, to me is uh, you need to use uh, maybe a, a, an IC engine like I was mentioning the the rotary uh, uh, IC engine that is Wankel engine which is um, which can which can produce a lot of power and then get it connected to the propellers or you can use fuel cells if you can uh, you uh, develop fuel cells which are very um, not only cost effective but have very high power density within a weight budget, then power, fuel cells can increase the payload of the drones almost three to four times. Um, I mean, in fact, there are fuel cells which are even better than that. So fuel cell is the one issue, and the whole um, capacity of drones, in the total weight of the drone, uh, if you look at the, the motor, the, the power supply system uh, takes about one third. The rest is the structure, the battery, the control system. So if you can make the structure lightweight, you save that much of um, load and increase the payload. And uh, then if you can improve the power supply for the motors to fuel cell, it also adds. So lightweight structure and uh, fuel cell are the two possibilities to increase the payload capacity of the, 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 the drones. So that is, uh, uh, quadcopter, or hexcopter, or octocopter. This is the solution that that's possible. Uh, can you please list our general failures that occur uh, seldom? Uh, the, uh, I think uh, we need a lot of lot of pages to do general failures. The the <laughs> only failure that happens is uh, failure is not. There is no failure as such. Really, honestly, there is not a uh, list of big uh, big list of failures. The failures happen when you are learning. Uh, we are too uh, eager to do big things without uh, having skills developed. Uh, you want to fly beyond visible range. You want to fly, you do a maneuver uh, too soon. Um, this is uh, something which is lack of training. And therefore, failure is due to human error, the pilot error. But there are possibilities because then, uh, for example, they, 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 we have seen most of the times the, the propellers. Propellers are actually weaklings. Propellers also fail. Uh, propellers are not properly anchored, and they're, they're, if one of the propellers uh, sort of declutch or uh, get removed, you have a, a, a uncontrolled uh, uh, possibility. Most of the failures today is I forgot to mention in the main presentation. These drones, quadcopter, for example, are not designed, uh, not well equipped to handle crosswinds. Crosswinds beyond say. 15 kilometers per hour wind, uh, 15 meters per second, sorry, 15 meters per second wind is impossible, almost impossible for the these drones to handle. Okay, they're very lightweight and a heavy wind, crosswind, makes that simply go. So we have lost many, many, many drones uh, because of the wind conditions. The wind conditions uh, being very harsh, uh, particularly the, the, the gust, which is vertical, and the side the side winds, so sideward the winds, uh, make this uh, thing, and you lose the you lose the, the, the drone very soon. You, you simply don't have control because very unstable in that weather condition. Okay, so this is something which I, I think I must mention. This is one of the general failures which we. So if you must have a <laughs> when you operate drones, you must have a good idea of what is the wind pattern in the area. Um, including the, 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 the distance in which you, you 
fly. If you're flying five kilometers away, you must have radius uh, on a 10 kilometer, uh, 10 kilometer range, the wind pattern. Uh, Without that, it's very dangerous to fly drones, in this, particularly the quadcopters. And that is something which you must keep in mind. And then the anonymous attendee, uh, this was from Lalita Megina, that question. Um, then uh, the, to get uh, enter into drone technologies, what are the skills you would uh, develop? Well, you, I say this. Now, you need to look at I mean, there are a lot of issues. Uh, you can't be, buy a, a drone and then fly it, because then it's very kid stuff. But you must understand the basics. You must understand the aerodynamics. You must understand the, the control system. In my opinion, if you want to build a plane and you want to operate the plane, drone, you must understand the control system very, very well. This is the core thing. And then the skill, other skill is having a flown a drone successfully for a long time, you get data. Now, what you want to do with that, you just show your friends and say, pride yourself, showing good photographs of what pictures you have taken. That's not a professional engineer's job. If you do an agricultural mapping, if you do a sea, even a coastal mapping, you will need to find out what to do with the data, how to handle, how to um, dissect information and get out information from that uh, voluminous data. So this is something which is a good thing that you ask the question. Today, we don't have people. We have flyers who build us, but we don't have people who process data, optical data. The GPS and the data which you get from the uh, survey, it could be agriculture, it could be medical, it could be whatever. That data processing is very important. And that takes, if you fly for one hour and you collect data for one hour from a drone, it needs almost 10 hours to process that data. And that should be done, with, for example, if you do an agricultural mapping, you can't just do without the agricultural knowledge. So you must uh, tie up with somebody from agriculture, uh, maybe an entomologist or agricultural experts and, or a weatherman, and find out what he wants and how he wants. So that skill of processing data is a major, major uh, thing, which, is, uh, which will make the drone operations um, uh, useful to the society. Um, so this is our last one. Okay, now, okay. Okay, now there are many, many questions. Now, uh, uh, Vijay? Yes, sir. Vijay, there are many, many more questions. Uh, the, I think that's it. Almost there are last two, three questions. Uh, uh, this one. No, no, we, I don't have a problem. But, uh, yeah, it is uh, just beyond 6.30. Okay, okay. All right, so um, can you please mention maximum area and maximum play recorded in India till now? Oh, well, actually, uh, very recently, I don't know, maybe, maybe I've left out a few questions, but people who have not been answered, you please uh, mail, uh, mail those questions. <coughs> we will try to answer through your mail. You please uh, fix your email ID in that, so we will try to answer that. But this is important. Can you please mention maximum area and maximum payload recorded in India till now? Well, well, this is just not one area or not one payload. Um, uh, the, the recent uh, recent trial in an university has been uh, to run an IC engine powered drone continuously for eight hours. Eight hours with the payload. I don't remember exactly payload, but uh, the it, it is not the area. It is the, uh, the, dis the, 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 the duration, the endurance that's more important. And this, again, uh, have not been tried out, um, tried out at uh, altitude, very high altitude. They're all uh, maybe a kilometer, 500, 200 meters, and so on. So we, 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 we can Google this information. And I, I, sus I suspect I may not be able to do, um, just in answering this question, mention maximum area. Now, it depends. For example, if you run for one hour, and if you fly at the optimum speed of say 15 meters per second, um, you can, uh, we, we do this continuously. We, we plan the, the scanning by um, on an agricultural field by assuming some uh, speed of flight and how many sorties you must do across the area. So we can, we can um, I mean, when you say area, are you talking about the periphery? Are you talking about covering the entire area? Today, uh, one hour flight, for example, we are very comfortable with three to four square kilometers. 
This is what we did uh, in Andhra Pradesh. And in India. I mean, it depends on this, the robustness of the vehicle, how fast you can uh, uh, speed it up, run it, uh, how fast, uh, how, at what altitude. So there are a lot of conditions in, in answering the question. So you probably you are better off in talking to somebody through through a Google Google search. Um, it's possible to use drone uh, as internet uh, internet towers for 5G. Well, I really don't know. Well, I don't think we have that capacity on the drone to be able to transmit. Well, actually, a similar thing has been done, not 5G, but uh, during flood, for example, um, drones were used as you you had the temporary internet stations and people who had uh, they were given a different identified frequency because the transmission towers were either clogged because of a lot of uh, traffic uh, internet messages or they were damaged so the, the the drones were kept here and there as uh, temporary towers uh, transmission tower relay towers and uh, uh, yeah, a particular frequency was assigned and people were able to communicate to them but i'm not too sure uh, whether for 5G, whether we can use drone, I, I really don't know. I mean, you, must, you must be able to ask some, uh, but it can carry. I mean, if we, if we can carry 40 to 50 kilograms of power, I mean, payload, what it can do with reference to the transmission um, uh, of 5G data and 5G information is something which uh, I really am not able to answer. But uh, why not is a question. But 5G, I'm not too sure. So I just okay. So as we know that region of Tamil Nadu, the fishermen are being missed. Can we use drone and keep track of them? Yes, indeed, indeed. Now the problem with this, um, uh, you must really see the uh, correct uh, situation. The fishermen, the fishermen are missing because uh, because they are in a uh, in a rough sea, in a, in a very very uh, windy, gusty environment. So you, you can spot them, but I don't think we can use drones, uh, say quadcopter or excopter, and go to the depth of the sea where fishermen are stranded and locate them because it is first of all dangerous or almost difficult or almost impossible for the drones to operate in such heavy winds. If you're talking about 80 kilometers per hour wind, no chance that you can push drones in that windy condition to, to rescue, to spot a fisherman. It has just been done with heavy, heavy aircraft, heavier aircraft. And then drones perhaps are not the candidates to help to spot fishermen in distress in rough seas, in very heavy wind condition. So the, the idea is good, but I think there's a limitation on the drones because of the speed condition, wind speed, which they cannot handle. Uh, in that condition, their fishermen are stuck in the sea. Is there an existing technology that can prevent from detecting flying objects? Uh, flying objects detecting. Um, is there an existing technology that can prevent? Well, I, I need some clarity. I, I didn't understand this question. Is there an existing technology that can prevent from detecting flying objects? So, if you don't mind, uh, you please make a little more elaborate uh, backup information on this. I'll try to answer that. You send it to India. I will probably try to answer. That. For landslide detection, can we use LIDAR? Yes, indeed. For landslide detection, can we use LIDAR? Um, we, we chose the topic of Smart India Hackathon. Okay, now the LIDAR, LIDAR is uh,